Who says tech can't be human? What's going on, Hacker Valley fam? Welcome back to the show. I got to say, we are doing something special today. We are in person. Usually our podcast is virtual, but we had to do something special because we have some great partners. Who is sponsoring this episode to make this beauty happen? I could tell you right now is Valence Security. They are changing the game when it comes to SaaS security in the SSPM space to kick off this conversation and to talk about the, the discussion and the topic of SaaS security, I have Bob Horn, Chief Revenue Officer at Valence. Bob, this podcast has been in the making for probably like two months now. I'm glad that we made it happen. Welcome to the show. Well, thank you. Now, I'm super excited to be here. Um, I'm usually the high energy guy, so <laughs> that may be a problem. So we're going to have to probably keep, we'll match keep, keep matching and wrapping <laughs> it up. So uh, no, thanks for thanks for having me and really excited to be here at the event and also yeah. you know, record this podcast. Yeah, exactly. This event is called On the Big Screen. The intention behind it was to bring security leaders and CISOs and also uh, great vendors like yourself and have them have conversations, especially through media. I feel like this is one of the avenues that is so powerful in today's world, media, content, and good old fashioned in-person conversations. You combine those together, you have something special. So let's first kick it off by talking a little bit about yourself. Yeah. I looked at your background and I was like, whoa, this guy has been at some crazy successful companies and now you're leading sales and customer success at Valence. Uh, I usually, you know, hear the CRO more so leading sales, but you're doing something a little bit different. And even the way that you're building your organization, I'm excited to learn more. But let's talk about how you got here in the first place. Yeah. So how much time do you have? Um, so it's a it's it's a long list. So yeah. I'll try to I'll try to be brief here because nobody really cares about you know my career over time. But we'll give you a, a few nuggets as yeah. as we talk. So. Um, I think we, we were talking last night at a CISO event as I was doing calculating and I could I could count to 25. So I've been in sales for this is my 25th year in sales. The vast majority have been some form and fashion into cybersecurity, identity management, et cetera. I've been really privileged to be around some of the you know legendary leaders um, in in business in general. And then as as technology has evolved over the years, people like uh, Scott McNeely, people like Mark Benioff, you know, even early in my career when I worked for the airline, Bob Crandall's probably one of the biggest legends in the airline mm. industry. So I've gotten a great chance to you know, be around some incredible leaders and emulate them. Also been around some of the great sellers of our time. So early days for me was building out an identity management business at Sun Microsystems. Um, got to meet, you know, all the the people from currently at, at SailPoint, formerly Waveset that we used to work with, um, people like Mark McLean and Marty Fredrickson. And then, uh, then as I mentioned, I went to Salesforce um, and did a few different startups as well. I think I'm at about six different startups. Most of them have been in security. One was in AI, one Ooh. was in uh, connected car as well. So um, I feel like my background you know, has gone a, a lot of different directions, um, but the most important thing was being around great leaders, great salespeople, and also ecosystem. Mm. So let's not forget as well that it's not just about what we're doing as our business and our company, it's building the right ecosystem around us. And so again, fortunate to spend some time with great leaders in our ecosystem and partner network too. That's what it's all about. A lot of the times when I speak to sales leaders in cybersecurity, they think that, you know, who wants to hear about sales? A lot of cybersecurity practitioners actually do. Uh, one of our most watched episodes was about uh, sales. It was, a, it was this roundtable where we had a few sales uh, leaders come in and also a practitioner and talked about some of the symbiotic relationships, but also some of the challenges that happened along the way. What do you think has been the most impactful moment that has led up to you now being the CRO? Yeah, I would probably say, yeah, there's probably two that are, there's a lot by the way, but, yeah. but there's probably two that jump out at me. I would say the first one, and I mentioned, you know, meeting some of the folks when we acquired Waveset when I was at Sun and got to spend some time with the early pioneers of the identity management business. And it wasn't mm -hmm. really about identity management as a whole, right? We were actually transforming businesses. Right. So the early days when you were dealing at with everything from directories to access to user provisioning and, and as SOCs came out, um, being able to tie ourselves to, to regulation and really kind of took from product to solving business problems. And 
that's one of the things that I've always taken with me is selling is not about pitching your product. Nobody cares. Right. Right. What they really care about is, do you really understand my problem? Have you diagnosed it? Have you made a connection with me? And then, you know, is, is it valuable enough that I'm going to, I need to make a purchase. I need to buy this because I need it now. And, and so that was probably the, the first seminal moment for me. The second one, um, I would say is working at salesforce.com. And, you know, it's interesting. I, I'm kind of, I, I'm really excited to be here, but there's also a session on storytelling right now. And yeah. anybody that knows me <laughs> knows that is near and dear to my heart. I love storytelling. And then, and at the heart of what we do as sellers, we're storytellers. Absolutely. And, and my boot camp at Salesforce was led by Eli Cohen, Doug Landis, uh, Aaron Farley. I'm sure I'm forgetting some names, but they just ingrained storytelling in my head, right? It's yep. all about creating that connection, but telling stories about how our customers are using the product and the value that future customers and prospects can get. And so, you know, those are probably, you know, the two seminal moments for, for my mm -hmm. sales career in terms of just development and learning along the way. I think it's all about storytelling. I think a story can take something that is seemingly invaluable and make it seem like the most valuable thing ever. I feel like when you look at things like Apple products, even Tesla, the story behind it, like the impact that you can make on the environment while looking cool, like that, that's what everybody wants yeah. at the end of the day is to feel good and look good. Um, and I think that when you look at the SaaS security space, there needs to be more stories there. It's such a big topic. I could tell you that in our world at Hacker Valley, we use 100% SaaS. There is no asset that we have besides our laptops that is not in a SaaS um, environment. Like, so yeah. I feel like having that inventory, having that understanding is the best way to protect yourself. Uh, one of the common things that you hear all the time is you can't protect what you can't see or you can't yeah. protect what you don't know about. And I feel like that's so true, especially today with SaaS. But I wanted to hear from you. You know, you're kind of leading the charge. Valence is leading the charge on it. What is the current state of SaaS security? Yeah. So by the way, what are you doing to uh, secure your SaaS environment? <laughs> uh, the what I'm doing is looking at best practices. Yeah. We just onboarded an awesome tool that a lot of people use called HubSpot. Uh, HubSpot does not allow you to onboard without professional services. I'm very grateful for that. Yeah. Maybe I would have turned a blind eye, and that's like one of our most critical resources. Yeah. But having someone, um, you know, go through the best practices with us, and also some, uh, you know, uh, features in the HubSpot platform that say, "Hey, these three users don't have multi-factor authentication. Yeah. Do you want to enforce that on them?" And you know, just that's been like really my practice outside of you know being a cybersecurity practitioner. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, obviously, and HubSpot's a great product as well, and and we do secure that. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> so in in terms of just SaaS environments in general, right? I saw a stat the other day that seventy three percent of all companies now exclusively run their business on SaaS, and I think as you go up market, obviously that number's a, a bit lower. But right. yeah, you know, I'll use a um, I'll use a quote from uh, from from one of the customers that I met with recently. He said, you know. SaaS is, is by far the most ungoverned part of my environment, and it continues to get worse. Um, and, and that sort of stuck with me, right? Mm. Because SaaS is sort of this, are we expecting, you know, in this case, HubSpot or Salesforce or Microsoft, or you name the product, are we expecting them to secure their own product? And they do that. They do that. But if you think of every technology, every security technology that's existed, it's always secured another piece of technology. So right. why is SaaS any different? Um, the other really unique part about SaaS is it's probably the first product that I can recall that the business users do all of the evaluation, mm -hmm. they do the purchasing, they do the, uh, they operationalize it themselves, and they also administer. So in many cases, security and IT departments really never touch the product. Right. They don't even know it's there. And so it actually requires a higher level of security visibility and everything that goes along with it because it's, it's out there, then we don't even know about it. Right. Please allow me to jump in for a second and share a few details about our sponsor for this episode, Valen Security. We all contribute to the SaaS security problem. Have you recently connected an AI tool to Google Calendar or even Slack? Or have you shared a file by enabling anyone with the link to open it? Oops, with SaaS tools managed by different teams, IT can't see everything. This is where Valence Security comes in. Their team provides SaaS security posture management and remediation capabilities that enable your company to find and fix SaaS risk. 
from misconfigurations and identity risks to third-party integrations, Valence Security has you covered. With their solution, you can easily reduce your attack surface with automated workflows and business user collaboration. You can secure your SaaS environment today with Valence Security. Check them out by visiting valencesecurity.com and let them know that Hacker Valley sent you. Thank you, Valence Security, for sponsoring this episode. What I wanted to ask, what I was curious about is the problem space that you all are in. So how would you describe the problem space and the solution that you all have? Yeah, yeah. I mean, so the problem space is just, you know, as we talked about earlier, right, is people don't really have a good sense on where their risks lie within their SaaS environment. In many cases, they don't even know what their SaaS environment looks like, right? So, so really creating visibility um, is, a, is a huge part. So our, our tagline is basically we find and fix SaaS risks. Mm. And many companies out there are in the visibility business, they find. But as a practitioner, it's not just good to find things, right? right. You've got to find a way to fix them. And since nobody has extra resources lying around, finding more problems can also create another problem. So if you can really find some ways to do hybrid or auto remediation yeah. around that and create a workflow. And we, we also talk about our collaboration with the business. Again, the business truly runs and operates SaaS applications. So we want to make, make security the heroes. Um, ultimately, if the, if the security team and the CISO can provide the guardrails and the information and suggest things to the business, and also have the ability to, whether it's revoking data shares or tokens or things like that, if they're high risk and yep. just go ahead and do it, that's, that, that benefits security, it benefits the business and it benefits the overall company. So the things that we really look for, we kind of have four dimensions that, that we, we look um, for configuration management. So think of all the different configuration toggles in every application. Right. And so, and again, I, I'm the buyer of salesforce.com because I run sales. So I'm also the admin. And yep. as an admin, is it, wouldn't it be great if we can turn off MFA? Because, you know, it takes an extra step. It's not convenient for me. Well, we need someone to catch that and say, no, you've got to turn, turn MFA back on. Yep. Um, and, and when it comes to configurations, every release has more and more different configurations that you have to deal with. And so we're able to manage that. Mm -hmm. um, second thing would be data protection. So you had sent me a Google, a Google Doc earlier. Yeah. Um, how many times have you actually unshared Google Docs with, uh, with you know, any of your third parties that are out there? Unsharing, never. Never, right. Mm -hmm. So sensitive data can get in these files that you share with these third parties and nobody ever unshares. So we'll right. find hundreds of thousands of files, sometimes millions of files, shared externally that haven't been touched by anybody in 90 days. Mm. That's just a risk. Right. Um, we also look at the SaaS to SaaS integrations that, that, that are out there. And so it gives us a, while we're not a discovery company, it helps us discover the SaaS environment through those integrations themselves. And the integrations also will allow a third party to now own all the identities. So you've yeah. got all the tokens and non-human identities that are out there as well. I know for me, I love my Calendly. Calendly's integrated with great tool. <laughs> Salesforce, it's integrated with my Google Workspace, it's integrated yeah. with my Microsoft, it's integrated with a lot of things. And now Calendly owns my identity. And if somebody can grab that and escalate it, mm -hmm. and it's not governed by MFA as well. Um, and then the last thing is identity, right? The traditional who has access to what, who has access to what within their SaaS environment. So we kind of look at those four different dimensions. Yeah. One thing that I realize, you know, my time at being a security architect a few different times is a great security solution not only helps, you know, find and fix these things, but it makes your team better. We've seen this out of email security. We see this out of security awareness training. We see this even out of uh, things like, I think, SSPM. Like, it could help your team get better, especially if you have the capability of providing people recommendations. And, right. and, and sometimes it can feel like, you know, when security finds things that we're being yelled at. Yeah. But I think with the right solutions in place, it feels like I'm being guided rather than being told what to do or, or being afraid that I'm not doing the right thing. Yeah. How has it made you a better security practitioner, you know, being in the sales side? Like, yeah. has, has, has Valence made you step your security game up? Of, of course. <laughs> um, but, but, you know, look, there isn't any way that the company that wants to, to be insecure, right? They, yeah. they all want to make sure that they're <laughs> adhering to security policies. Most of it is just they don't know. 
Right. Most people really don't understand why they're using MFA and how how much more secure the company is as a result of it. So a lot of it, to your point on security awareness, are you checking a box? Or are you actually collaborating and enabling the business? And so I, I don't know how many, I, I didn't know how many file shares I had out there and, and I didn't really care. But if somebody tapped me on the shoulder and said, hey, by the way, you've got these 500 that you know, nobody's touched in 90 days, um, mm -hmm. oh great, let's go revoke them and right. click the revoke button. Or you know, a lot of times when I get those things, I forget about it and I don't click the revoke button and 30 mm -hmm. days later, they'll give say, hey, you got one day to click the revoke or we're just gonna revoke it for you. I'm like, great, just go revoke it for me. I don't right. need it. If someone hasn't accessed it in 90 days, you probably don't need the file. Yeah, I would just let it go to the, till the next day and if yeah. it does it, then you could always, you could always reopen that access. Exactly. I think that that is one of the simple use cases that anyone can understand. Do you have a Google Drive or a Microsoft Cloud account? Do you have things that has uh, the anyone with this link can view or edit? And that's so easy to understand. And it's easy to understand that there is sensitive information. Our IP is all the, the collection of all of our resources because all of those resources and pieces of data, they tell the story of our companies. They might even tell the stories of our customers in a positive or negative way. Yeah. So you gotta be very mindful about how you share and how long you share it and who you share it with. Um, but and, and by the way, every once in a while, we might see a file get sent by an executive that's titled password. <laughs> Probably not something they wanted to share. I would imagine all the time. And when you look at an app like Calendly or you look at an app like uh, Google Drive, for instance, we're giving OAuth grants to everything. Google Drive has access to our Slack. Yeah. And I know for a fact every organization has someone in their team that shares creds over Slack or Microsoft Teams. Salespeople never do that. <laughs> um, yeah. so. We'll keep it that way. <laughs> we'll, we'll just say that. Uh, what about the attacks? I think the data privacy, data security is one easy thing to understand, but I don't think people understand what is the consequence of being attacked and finding yourself vulnerable. So what have you seen from the news or even responses yeah. from customers? No, we've had a couple recently um, that, you know, pretty significant SaaS attacks. One by, you know, unfortunately by our partner, uh, Microsoft, um, by Midnight Blizzard. By the way, I mean, I, whoever does marketing and naming for these attack these attackers, kudos. I mean, I think, yeah, it's kind of interesting. And then you know, even Cloudflare, which was a third party risk result from from Okta. So we're starting to see SaaS attacks ramped up, um, and it's typically you know something very similar. So I know you know the the Microsoft attack was more of a password spray. Mm. Um, grab a grab a. I think it was in a test. I think it was a test um, uh, environment. And they grabbed the credential, um, put it in a production environment, and then started doing data exfiltration through, um, through email. So they created an email account through the credential. Mm. Then you've got Cloudflare, which came through as a part of the Okta problem. They did forensics on, I want to say, about 5,000 different service accounts and tokens. They, they missed four. Mm. And those four were, were actually used um, to gather... Um, data, wiki, source code, um, and, and then they escalated the privileges and started changing admin rights. And so all attacks start to look somewhat the same. Grab a credential, escalate the privilege, and do whatever you want. Right. What could have, what could have been done about either of those instances? Yeah, so, so ultimately, you know, it's creating visibility and, and cleansing and cleaning because most of those tend to be dormant accounts. So, you know, even one of our, one of our customers we found, they had three times the number of employees in dormant accounts. So a lot of these have privileges, but they're just sitting there and that's, that's gold for an attacker. So, you know, it's truly find these tokens, find mm -hmm. these files, find these integrations, whatever it is. And if you're not using them, let's clean them up. Let's right. revoke, let's, let's, you know, let's remediate them. Love that. One thing that I was really excited about when it comes to Valence was the way that you all are trying to reach your target audience. You're doing things like this. Really appreciate you guys coming on the podcast and getting some of your time. But when we spoke originally, you mentioned how you're kind of building out sales and marketing and 
customer success in a different way that I have never heard of or seen. Describe, you know, that process and what, what it is that you're building. Yeah. And, and I don't know if it's unheard of, but but it's definitely a little bit different than I've done before. Um, question for you, though. You're you you were a security buyer for for quite a while, right? You mm -hmm. know, great, great career as a practitioner. Um, when you bought, how would you buy? Would you buy from the cold emails you get, the cold calls you get from partners, from your peers? Like, tell me a little bit about how you bought. The only cold email or cold call that I've ever taken has been because I've signed up for a demo. Like if I've signed up for a demo, then yeah, it's all right to cold email me. I probably won't respond unless I'm ready, but that's typically the only ones I, I respond to. If I am further along in the journey, one thing that's been really helpful if I'm not interacting with sales or any other, anyone from the team is self-service. I love to be served, uh, you know, self-service style. The only thing that I don't like about self-service is when you talk to someone on the phone and it's a bot, that could be a little yeah, frustrating. Yeah. But when you're looking at a security product and having like either tool tips or getting an email saying, hey, we saw that you got stopped at this feature. Here's the documentation for that feature. This is like a common stop point or a common gap. Yeah. Those are like uh, a few ways. And when it comes to in person, it's definitely at events through social selling. If someone makes an introduction and says, hey, Ron, I want you to meet Bob. Bob works at Valence. Valence is doing something new, interesting. I know you personally. I know Bob personally. Have a conversation. That's the best way to my yeah. heart. Which is how we first met, right? Mutual yeah. con mutual contact made the intro. But so my hypothesis, and this is kind of comes out of taking a little bit of time off as well. And and I'll give a I'll give kind of a quick story. When I went um, to RSA, and and I did something I never do. I actually went down to the floor. Like when's the last time you actually went down to the floor? Yeah. And I you know haven't been doing this for a long time. I felt like I know most <laughs> companies and know a lot of people. And I went right. down there. I'm like who are these companies and who are these people? Yeah. And, and so it, it, it kind of jogged my mind. So I asked a question that evening out for drinks with a couple CISOs and I said, I, I empathize with what you're dealing with right now because you guys are getting hammered by everybody. Right. How do you figure out who to buy from, what companies, what problems to solve, the technology and all those things? And, and the, the answer was very similar to what you gave, right? I buy from people I know and trust. Mm -hmm. I buy from influencer networks that are, that are out there, Hacker Valley being, being one. Um, I buy from my peers and I'll even talk to analysts and, and buy from them as well. And so that's kind of how I think about it. And this is, so I asked them the question around, you know, cold outreach and they're like, yeah. no, never. I, you know, in fact, a CISO yesterday told me he gets somewhere between 12 and 36 cold outreach emails per day and about 25 phone calls and said he hasn't responded to one in mm -hmm. a long period of time. And so my, my thesis is cold outreach is dead. You can flip it to warm outreach or what I call influencer led selling, right? And right. think about how we buy in our personal lives as well. Um, and I was having a conversation with some of my peers. And you know, if you think of the biggest, the biggest brand and influencer in the world right now is Taylor Swift. Yeah, and, especially right and, now. <laughs> and when, yeah, when she recommends something, there's a whole group of people that buy. Yes. And and how we buy in the business context and how we buy in in our personal context are somewhat blended, right? We want we want to hear from people that they had a great experience. They recommend it, um, and that it's that it's validated and vouched for. And so, instead of and, and I always have loved my SDRs, right? I've had amazing SDR teams, mm -hmm. SDR armies that I've built. Everyone this time, I just decided I'm not going to do that. I'm going to repurpose the dollars, and we're going to really spend it on influencer networks that mm -hmm. are actually going to bring value to the customer, right. not just bring leads to the company. And right. and so it it helps us uh, short circuit a little bit. It it it, it gets us to the right people. It also, you know, gives shortens the sales cycle a little bit as well because we're talking to the right people that actually sort of they're warmed up to mm -hmm. talk to us, um, and they know they know their problem, they know a little bit about us, and so we can kind of bring that together. That's powerful. I think that is just you're still building a BDR team. It's just they're in the field working yeah. for you. We work for you. We're actually going to have uh, Shlomi on the podcast next. I'm super excited about that. And one thing that I do for all of our partners, I speak to the co-founders. I speak to the executives like yourself, and it makes me excited. It makes me want to support you, whether you know we have a, some type of sponsored relationship or not. I think that there's just a lot of good that can come from good old, good old fashioned networking yeah. and social selling. I think that's what it's all about. And I'm sure that you all sell each other in the sales realm, but maybe it's just through like, hey, where do you want to work next? come work at Valence. Do you see kind of like your team also being influencers as like recruiters? 
A absolutely. I mean, you, we, there's so many different types of networks that we deal with, right? It's the, it's, it's the salespeople on the ground, but also, you know, these investor groups as well. Yeah. So YL's got their YL advisors and they're all just amazing, super smart, helpful people that we, we tap into as well for some introductions or even just to understand their business. Because mm -hmm. as you're sort of describing, we're kind of going back to the future a little bit in, in how we engage with customers and part of back to the future is i love the face-to-face -face, that yeah. nothing nothing is better than going from a 2d world to a 3d world and, right. and getting to know people um and and so and and also just getting back to understanding the business problems that we're trying to solve versus just pitching our capabilities and features and functions so i can tell you this podcast would feel 100 percent different if it was virtual like it would still yeah. be great a lot of conversation and banter but there's nothing like it being in person because right after this, we get to still talk throughout the day and right. chit chat and walk as well. I think walking is a big component of of selling and having an opportunity to network because there's there's the idea of movement and, you know, uh, networking is a verb. And I think when we're sitting at home on the Zoom screen, we're not really animated as much as we can be. Yeah, that that's right. And so you should probably keep your your podcast with Shlomi though virtual because you can cut off the dad jokes that he's going to throw out. So just be a little bit wary of that. Right. <laughs> so what what do you, what do you want to see out of the future? Let's kind of focus on Valence, and I would love to also hear about your own future as well. Yeah. Um, I don't know that I know about my own future, right? Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to get my kids out of college, and that's really the my my personal goal. Keep right them now, in college but, for now. But, I'm sure that's as far a, as the challenge. company and the team. Yeah, you know, it's it's we're sort of in that growth phase, right? I, yeah. yeah. Um, startups go through three phases, right? You go from product market fit yep. to repeatability to scalability. We're sort of right on the cusp of building that repeatability engine and then mm. growing the team and moving from there. Um, I think, you know, another another area for us that's going to, you know, be something we're really looking at and 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 thinking about is what does Gen AI do to SaaS? And and it's not about us building Gen AI necessarily into our product itself, which we we do have some assistance, but it's more about these SaaS applications and what data Mm -hmm. Are they sharing and and how can AI change configurations and things like that? So we're thinking a lot about that because that's probably the next thing for for valence as well. Big time. I think that's really kind of the big question mark for a lot of teams and organizations, even my own. Like I want my teams to use things like ChatGPT, but I also want them to be mindful about what they put into ChatGPT, like putting yeah. a meeting that's just kind of like a podcast scoping call into ChatGPT is great putting a meeting where we're talking about deal size or sp specifics on like who is the customer's ICP, that's that's a no-no to put yeah. in the chat GPT. Yeah. Um, but there's there's ways around it. It's about knowing like how these tools serve you best and having you know a great partner to give you that final piece of assistance to make sure that everything runs smoothly. Yeah, we were actually, uh, almost every conversation I have, we start talking about privacy and policy and yeah, the lawyers getting involved. I mean, yeah. I think I think yeah, AI is going to be great for software companies. Yep. Probably better for the legal profession because yeah, there's going to there's there is going to be a lot of work for them to do to figure all of this out. Right. So there's a lot of people in our audience that are in the SaaS space, but from a cybersecurity perspective, they're in the business of protecting their organization and really being a shepherd of privacy and security rather than an enforcer of and bearer of bad news. For anyone that's out there that's listening right now that wants to be a little bit better with SaaS security, what will your advice be for them? Yeah, I, I think it's first off, figure out what you have, right? And and then start to look at those four dimensions. So this is where I'll do like a little bit of a, a commercial, but it's, Please. it's it's how we help our customers, right? And so when I talk about solving business problems, sometimes you don't know exactly how big the problem is and the best way to do that. And we actually use our product mm -hmm. to figure that out. So normally you're doing a proof of concept that just shows off the product. Our assessments, or even we call them proof of values as well, is we'll actually go in and, and it's really, really simple. It's because you're logging in. We're not, we're not putting any agents out there. We're just logging in. If you've got the admin credential, then we can look at a couple of your applications and it's gonna, it's gonna tell you, you know, how compliant are the configurations? What's misconfigured? Right. It's going to give you a, an inventory of the data shares externally and access. It's going to look at all the SaaS to SaaS integrations and then also your identities. So it's a simple, easy way 
to just take a look at your environment and and make some decisions from there. Hey, you know, I found some things that that bother me or wow, I'm actually pretty, pretty good. We're doing a good job. And so you want to you want to understand what you're dealing with. That's what it's all about. You got to you got to be able to understand who you are first, whether it's from like a SaaS perspective or whatever perspective yeah. that you want to secure. And thank you so much for taking some time out of your busy day to jump on the mics with us. Speak a little bit about yourself, but uh, also just as important, Valence Security. We speak to every partner, every vendor that sponsors this podcast. I got to say, I personally love Valence and what y'all are building. So big shout outs to you all and also highly encourage the audience to check out Valence Security. For anyone that wants to stay up to date with Bob or Valence Security, be sure to check out the show notes or description wherever you're watching or listening. And with that, we will see everyone next time.